It's a full house. How's everybody doing? You guys are rocking. Um, how many people uh, um, are here because they own an arts and crafts house? Okay. Yeah. Nice. Um, okay, that's good. Uh, how many people are builders here? There's not a ton. How many architects? You're an architect. Builder too. Organizers. Um, good. Well, uh, I want to thank you guys for coming. There is a there is a reason why uh, everybody's here. Why this is our most popular one. We had almost 250 people sign up for this, um, and so a lot of those are virtual. But obviously, the biggest crowd we've had. Um, and I think there's a reason why, uh, and we'll get into that. I'll, I'll tell you at the end. I've got a couple zingers that uh, I think are are really interesting and, and telling, okay? I think there's a reason why um, we are attracted to the arts and crafts style, okay? I think that uh, there are things that are going on there that I'll explain um, that we're attracted to it for a reason. I also think that there are great lessons we can learn from this period, um, and uh, so it, it's going to be fun. Uh, I do want to thank my sponsors. Uh, this is a shout out to Ryan Mulkeen. He's watching with his son in New Jersey to the Cucan Classical Molding Collection. I designed their molding collection. They're our sponsor here. Um, great guys. Really, they get moldings, they get details, as well as Windsor One. And Dave is in the audience here. Woo -hoo. Um, so thank you guys for sponsoring this event. They're, they're the ones who are putting up the free beer. So they're here, here. <laughs> Um, the, uh, so anyway, thank you. I also want to shout out to my buddy, Richard. If you don't follow him, I got a free, uh, hoodie tonight. Isn't this awesome? So that's, uh, Finnish Carpenter TV is on YouTube. That's Richard right there. Master Carpenter got me that. Really excited about that. Um, the, uh, I've got a chair here too. This is kind of a teaser. I've got a, this chair. Anybody recognize this chair? You, you can take it home with you if you reckon. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Anybody recognize that chair? Who, who the designer of this chair is? Hans Wagner. No one? Okay. Wagner. Wagner. So, uh, famous chair designer. We're going to talk about that. I'm not just, I'm not, yeah, we do have a lot to learn. So, a lot of good stuff tonight. I'm very excited. Now, this is kind of our agenda. We're going to talk about the arts and crafts movement. Uh, it's a rejection of the Victorian things. There's a lot of stuff there, good stuff. We're going to dive into the prairie craftsmen and bungalow styles, okay? Um, what those styles are, why they are what they are. Uh, we're going to talk about, obviously, the designers that kind of, you know, emphasized and, and designed those things. Gustav Stickley, New York, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, and then Charles and Henry Green out in California. Uh, we're going to talk about kid homes. and um, uh, the Sears homes, the Aladdin, some of those things, uh, and kind of why that happened and, and, and what's going on there, kind of the building side of this thing. And then we're going to talk about these lessons, why we're attracted to this style and why houses before 1940 are so charming. Um, I think that houses before 1940 are more charming, better looking, better designed than new houses. Who agrees with me? Mm. Preaching to the choir. Um, and so we're going to talk about that. We're going to explain why, why that's the case. Uh, so each time, if you haven't been to one of these before, by the way, if you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. Um, the, uh, if, you don't, if you haven't been following us, the, the, we're doing, we are now in the arts and crafts period. We started with the Georgian. They're available on YouTube. You can go look at all of the different ones. And that, somebody asked me, hey, why are you doing that? Um, and I go, well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I started doing this because I wanted to, you know, I care about building. And I care about that we build better houses today. And I think if we look to the path, there are great lessons we can learn from there. And so I wanted to tell those stories, right? Why Georgian and what the, 
handmade really meant and how that all worked. And so uh, with each period, we talk about where America is and, you know, what the country was, what was going on, because the arts and crafts style is an American style. It is a uh, it's something that it, that communicates who we are. And and so there's things that are going on in society that influence our architectural styles. It's not just, well, we just built that then. There's a reason why we build those things. So United States, 1910, population 92 million. If you uh, keep ratcheting up the population, we are now a bigger country than the UK, uh, than the United Kingdom, um, which is significant because before we were kind of the you know redheaded stepchild to England, and if you were the study the the first part of the Victorian era, we talked about how England kind of looked at the U.S. like, <laughs> yeah, and um, and now we are uh, a world industrial power, um, and they're, they're talking about the uh, second re uh, industrial revolution as we build the re uh, railroads and canals as we really grow up as a country, not only just the first industrial revolution, the steam engine and things like that, 1820, 1850, but this is the second one is, as our cities become more robust and as our technology and our homes and stuff is going crazy, we're really using our natural resources. Um, speaking of immigration, the reason why we were able to grow at a rate of 25%, 20% is because of immigration, right? Not only are we having a lot of babies, but there's immigration is just flooding into the country. Notice too, this is the last year where uh, rural population is greater than urban population. So we are starting to fill up our cities. We're moving from the farms into the cities. And I think about a city like Fort Worth, um, driving around, we have a huge housing stock of arts and crafts house, right? And you know, you think of Fairmount, Arlington Heights, I mean, they're everywhere. And so why? Well, because Fort Worth's really growing up then. There's industry happening here. People are moving in from the cities um, to, in from the farms into the cities. And this is the, you know, I guess this is the last year, last decade, and then starting in 1920, uh, it tips over the other side. So a lot of interesting things happening in America at that time. So what is the arts and crafts era? What, is, what are the ideals? What's going on there? It, it really is, and it's, it's reading all these books, by the way, there's some good books here. Um, Gustav Stickley, we're going to talk about him. But um, there are a ton. Of, somebody emailed me, what books should I be reading? There's like, I looked it up, and there's like 50 books like, that you could, you could read about this. And so there's a bunch of really good ones. This is an excellent one. Gustav Stickley, The American Arts and Crafts Movement. It has a catalog of his furniture in the back and a number of essays in the first part of it explaining how he did what he did, Gustav Stickley, who we're gonna talk about in a second. And they certainly talk about the rejection of Victorian values, the rejection of Victorian knickknacks, and we're gonna talk about that. Uh, simplicity and respect for materials and craft, right? Look at this little writing desk. Look how simple and clean that is, right? It's stained grade woods. It's, it's uh, honest joinery, right? The joinery that's coming through that's, that's pegged. It's not flowery, it's not ornamented, right? And so very different from the things that are Victorian. It is a change of taste, uh, and there is a new approach to the home. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this, but there is no doubt that as cities grow, okay, uh, people begin to look at the house and uh, how they live in the house much differently than they did maybe in, in when they were on the farm. Um, and so we're gonna talk about that. How we got here, it goes all the way back to the Crystal Palace exhibition in England in 1851, okay? So this exhibition, remember the Crystal Palace exhibition, they, they build basically a glass house, right? All from pre-manufactured metal parts. And it was a chance, kind of the first World's Fair, all these countries come in and kind of show off what they got. Well, we remember it for the, for the advancements in Industrial Revolution, but what they talk about at that time too is all the cheap products that are there, right? Things that are that were cast very cheaply and cheaply made. And the early kind of grumbling against uh, the over-industrialized Victorian era begins to happen here. John Ruskin, um, there's a sign up there that has one of his quotes. Gustav Stickley loved a quote about uh, John Ruskin about art and craft and design. He 
you know, he dies in like 1870, right? Uh, and Pugin was the one all about Gothic styles and, and, the, and the, uh, uh, the guilds and things like that. These guys are hearkening back and talking about how things used to be made, how things should be made. Um, that if we look back to the past, these were handmade. So their voice really carries forward. And Gustav Stickley, who is the main proponent for the arts and crafts era uh, in America, really picks up their voice. The first two issues of his magazine are about William Morris and John Ruskin. So these guys are very influential. William Morris um, is really the first guy to kind of put together uh, the arts and crafts into a working guild, okay? And so he looks at all the cheap products and he's like, gosh, this is terrible. These are ugly, they're not well made. And he puts together a you know, studio of fine craftsmen and fine you know, builders who can do beautiful things. He dies in 1896. Gustav Stickley really picks up his mantle and carries it forward. And then, of course, the name comes from the Arts and Crafts Exhibition in 1888. Edward Ashby is another Englishman who, who was about guilds and everything. What you find as you, as you uh, read the early stuff about the arts and crafts is that they really struggled with the art and the craft, okay, and how they make it affordable and where the machine should be involved in this whole thing. Like, um, you know, should everything be made by hand, okay, or should everything be made by my machine? Um, Gustav Stickley was one who said, no, we've got to have the machine. These are quotes that came from and that, that expressed those ideas. A thing is made ugly the moment the element of commercialism becomes the guiding motive of its production, right? What an interesting uh, uh, you know, struggle that they're having there. The struggle between art and commerce is a death grapple. One or the other must die. Um, yeah. Uh, so they are, they are trying to figure it out. One of the criticisms of the arts and crafts era is no one could afford it, right? That they would spend time, uh, you know, William Morse's papers and, his, and the rugs and the things they were doing were handmade and beautiful, right? Of course they were expensive. And so that kind of, you know, how do we make things beautiful? Because the other thing about the Victorian, and, then we're the, and this note here at Irene Sargent, we are working for a definite and high purpose that is the improvement of public taste. In other words, Victorian is ugly, okay? Victorian style is overdone, it's, it's, it's ugly, it's, it's, uh, it's too much, right? And so they, there is no doubt in reading these books that these guys were about improving uh, society through improving our taste, okay? So, which is kind of fascinating, a little bit elitist, right? A little bit, um, you know, we know more than you, uh, but also this struggle that things were cheap, that they were making things that, that were disposable. And so, you know, certainly we hear that today, right? And I think of houses and I think of things that we're making that are disposable. And a hundred years ago, they were having that same discussion. Interesting. Um, so this is the Victorian interior that they are rejecting, okay? This is what they're looking at and going, it's cluttered, right? It's filled with cheaply made products. It's unhealthy, right? This is when the, the whole health movement came to be a part of this deal, where uh, the shingle style houses and the things moving out to the East Coast to get fresh air, right? That was all part of the late Victorian era. But these were unhealthy places to live. And so um, they're, they're overdone, right? And so you begin to look at these, and I think about those mantles and some of the millwork catalogs that had all these different shelves on them. Well, they were, they were shelves for little knickknacks and little brackets and little cheap, cheap items. And you see them laid out over the table here. Um, and it is cluttered, right? And it is <coughs> kind, of, kind of messy. And yet the arts and crafts things, the things that Gustav Stickley is talking about, are very clean, very uh, uncluttered. There is a, definitely a desire for them to be a healthy, healthy space. And so a lot of his writing and stuff is, you know, expresses that, that kind of ideal. And, and look to kind of, you know, Queen Anne, Victorian, 1890, Gustav Stickley's uh, Craftsman Farms, uh, 1905, right? Painted heavily ornamented, all this crap everywhere, right? Um, very simple, rustic, uh, you know, uh, simple, right? And so there, there, there's not only this, 
desire for simplicity, it's honesty too. It's, 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 it is um, that we want our joinery to be honest, that we want uh, our buildings to be honest. And, and there, you get into that whole character of the individual that this is fake and this is real. Looking at the chair, right? This is a, a chair like 1899, okay? Just these, these carved elements, this kind of empire style, this uh, you know, velvet velour seat, unhealthy, um, but, but it, it's, it's heavily ornamented, right? This, by contrast, the Morris chair from Stickley, notice that the joinery sticks through here and at its peg, right? That was considered to be an honest trait, like the, that we are not hiding anything here everything is expressed very simply the fact that it's a uh, stain grade the fact that you know it's unadorned is 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 very appealing even this little stair light there at the hallway where you see these very elaborate you know um over the top heavily ornamented you know lighting and then the the arts and crafts solution right just they are a different way of thinking about building, a different way of approaching um, design and, you know, and craft. There are also a number of other influences. Pardon me. This will be an advertisement for light beer. <laughs> Got a bad throat today. There was also a number of other influences, and what's clear and we'll talk about it when we talk about Stickley, is this is a very brief thing that comes up. I mean, Gustav Stickley, we'll talk about it in a sec, you know, starts in 1901. He's bankrupt by 1915, okay? So it is a brief window of time. And uh, there are a number of other influences going on here that are speaking into what house style should be. And one of them is certainly women's magazines. Now... These start to appear, pulp paper, and things are, are much easier to, to print and things like that. So magazines start to you know, really grow at late, 18, late 18, 1800s. Uh, House Beautiful starts in uh, 1901. Um, but they are talking, they, these articles are talking about how to design their house, how to live in their house, how to, how to make a house work. They're also talking about this function, this, the science of the home, and we'll talk about that. We are entering a new consumer age. I just finished the book, uh, um, The People's Tycoon, about Henry Ford. Henry Ford, you know, so his cars are right during this period, and 1906, 1910. And, and one of the reasons why Henry Ford went to a $5 a day, uh, uh, $5 a week, $5 a day pay schedule, which was... You know, people were getting about a dollar a day to, to work. He started paying his people five dollars a day. And so it was just, you know, it created an incredible stir. Um, and it was it was unheard of that he was paying people. Part of the reason why he was doing that is because he recognized that we were in a consumer age, that he wanted his people to participate, to be able to buy one of his cars, right? To be able to uh, buy houses. And so he clearly recognized that we had entered a, a new consumer age. And of course, world events are still very influential here. The Ladies Home Journal, uh, really written for uh, upper class women, uh, started in 1883. They publish a couple of Frank Lloyd Wright houses in 1901. And so um, this is kind of the first popular magazine to reach a million subscribers. Uh, but, you know, this is what they're going after, kind of the high-end lady. Um, I guess there's some stories in these other ones as far as how to go. Good Housekeeping, 1885. Okay, it's most popular in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, it's also geared to upper-class women. Uh, training for domestic service, right? Uh, beautiful pets. Uh, there's another. Uh, anyway, babies upbringing. They start a fascinating thing in like 1908 called the Good Housekeeping Seal of Approval, okay? Now, we all recognize that today, but that started in 1908, 1909, yeah, 1909, um, as a scientific way of approaching the, the kitchen, right? And the scientific way of approaching household stuff. And they literally had a laboratory where they would test products. And so they were testing 
blenders and, and, and mixers and, and, and vacuums and, and all these different things. And so it's, you know, you can see it starts in 1909. It's something that I, 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 when I Googled it, it's still very prevalent today. But this points to the fact that they are thinking about the science of the home. I've got a, we'll talk about it in the next thing, period revival, we talk about kitchens, but the science of how a kitchen should work was something that was very important in that we're gonna study how many steps it takes. And they did these scientific, you know, stopwatch kind of studies on the kitchen to make it the most efficient space possible. And so, um, because it was a workspace, right? It was not a gathering space, this was a workspace. We needed to make it an efficient workspace. So. The approach to the house being the point here is changing at this time and how women uh, are living in their house and are living in cities. House Beautiful, 1896, also popular in the 50s and 60s. It's really the magazine that promotes the arts and crafts ideals the most. The first issue, article asks for wisdom and restraint in interior arrangements, relegate stuffed satin chairs and their ghastly impressiveness to a single room, right? <laughs> that is saying, get rid of that Victorian junk, right? And so, you know, relegate it to a different room. That's not how we want to live. Uh, this magazine was the most consistent champion for, you know, Gustav Stickley and, and those people. But you see that, you know, they're beautiful magazines, right? They're very appealing. They're very uh, charming. They're inviting. Um, I was trying to think, there's, there's, some, there's some titles here that were, that were really pretty interesting. Um, but these are, these are taste leaders, and they're, they're speaking about the number of different voices that speak into this arts and crafts thing. So as we study Gustav Stickley and Frank Lloyd Wright, you're going to realize that one of the reasons it's short-lived is because uh, there's so many other voices going on out there, and there's a lot of different people clamoring for how we should live. Um, and then the last thing, this world event thing, okay, we go, I'm going to go back to the World's Fair. This is something we studied last time, right? Um, this is the slide I was showing you from last time. Why, why am I showing it to you again? Well, because there's the Japanese pavilion, the Hohoden, um, was a, on an island at the World's Fair that was incredibly influential to the arts and crafts era. And I'm going to point out a couple of these details they're going to show you, but... The, as I read about this, it's clear that um, the way this thing was built, the way the, the way the craftsman put it together was all part of the, uh, you know, uh, it created a stir. And so basically the Japanese, the, the country sent over all these craftsmen and it ended up costing like $650,000 back then. And they, they uh, assembled this thing with their craftsmen. It was a reproduction of one of their famous historic buildings. Well, if you look at it, um, notice the, the deep overhanging eaves and, and the way it's put together. Just remember these images because we're gonna talk about them later when we talk about Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, the deep eaves, exposed raptors, the craftsmanship, the simplicity, these are all ideals that we'll talk about with the arts and crafts thing. This is 1893. Now, not coincidentally, uh, Charles and Henry Green stopped at the, the exposition from St. Louis on their way out to California, and you're going to see their stuff there. Frank Lloyd Wright in Chicago, this is where this is, greatly influenced by this building. And if you remember, you'll remember this inside, right? Notice how uncluttered it is. You know, notice the serene calmness handmade notice the joinery that's going on here with these beams and other thing remember that image right there this was a powerful piece of documentation that really we're going to get to much later okay so th these styles i've got them broken into craftsman bungalow and prairie okay now virginia McAllister in her book uh the field guide to american houses does not have craftsman, uh, does not have bungalow as a style. Okay, now why is that? Because a bungalow is a small house, right? We think, or I think, of bungalows today as being, you know, a low-pitched roof. And, and, but in the, in the early turn of the century, they speak of bungalows as uh, 
any house. I mean, there's Mediterranean bungalows, there's English bungalows. So it was a small, simple house as they describe it. So she really only breaks this time, the time to do into craftsmen and prairie styles. And I've kind of followed that. Now, <laughs> Gustav Stickley, uh, this guy's crazy. Okay. This guy is, uh, uh, a, a magician. <laughs> this guy's a fool. This guy is uh, a, a, a um, dreamer. Um, this guy's a risk taker. Uh, and yet he is the spokesman for the arts and crafts ideal. He is the spokesman for uh, all of the, the, this style and, and era that's going on here. And you'll see as, I'm, that as we study the, his magazine that he didn't write, um, he's, he's an amazing figure. So um, I talk about him capturing the spirit of the era. He starts a magazine in 1901 called The Craftsman. And uh, it's not written by him. It's written by a... Uh, art history professor at Syracuse named Irene Sargent. She writes it for the first five years. She's, she's expressing these ideals. Um, he's a furniture maker. He is a, a son of immigrants. Um, and he and five brothers are the ones that start the Stickley Furniture Companies that some of which are still around today. He starts out as an immigrant. He, he, he learns from his uncle how to, how to build. Uh, and, and he represents the immigrants we've been talking about that are moving over from Germany and all these other things that start so many great things in America. He's part of that, that era. 1893, there's a panic, uh, a financial panic. It's a crash that really lasts until 1900, 1899. And as they start to come out of that, um, he kind of catches lightning in a bottle in that he kind of had a standard furniture company, but he sees these styles changing. And when he launches his furniture catalog, it's different than anybody else has. It's, it's these, the Morris chair that I was showing you. It's these simple, clean lines. And it was, it was uh, you know, <laughs> it was at the perfect time and the perfect place. Um, he gains a lot of influence because, and, you know, he is the Instagram influencer of his day, right? He, you know, had a million followers kind of thing. Um, and, and, and I talked about how brief this period is that begins and then ends. First catalog in 1901, last catalog was in 1916. He's actually bankrupt in 1915. And so he has a catalog in 1916. He sells the farm in 1917. He's done. Okay, so realize that this is a brief period of time. Um, this is the 1909 catalog, but you see, you know, how things were expressed, and you can get a Morse chair for thirty-four dollars. Um, but this was this was his catalog. This is what he was expressing. It's it's ironic that he has so much influence in the period. He really he wasn't an architect, and he really only is involved in a couple houses. His first house in Syracuse, New York, before he used to, moved to New York City, was a uh, Victorian turn of the century house. He remodeled it in like 1903. So the interior, they're saying, which still isn't around anymore, uh, they're trying to restore it. But uh, that was one house, right? Well, this was, his, this was his other house. And so you think about him as being so influential in the period, but it really wasn't his architectural styles that were so influential. It was the ideals that he expressed and you know what he was going to do was he was going to start a uh, technical school for boys in New Jersey, and so he buys all this land in New Jersey. He's got his office building in New York. Um, this was going to be the cafeteria clubhouse. It ended up being his house, but he had to sell this uh, uh, after he went bankrupt. If you look at his magazine, so from 1901 to 1915, he's writing in his magazine. These are the kind of articles that are coming out. Uh, suburban house for a wide lot with little depth. Plain house that will last for generations. Um, they are, uh, they, they totally are talking about a way of life, okay? They aren't talking about your house needs to be this style. One of the ironic things is he tells people how to build furniture themselves, right? You wouldn't think that as a furniture maker, he would tell people how to make their own furniture, but it's like he didn't care about making money. It was like he didn't care. It was all about the, the magic of the era and, and how things came together. So this is where, you know, he's a fool, but he's brilliant. And he's so 
you know, cement, half, ha cement house with half timber <coughs> construction, right? We don't hear anything about cement houses in the arts and crafts period, right? And so, but he was, you know, really pushing the envelope for design and style and, and how things came together. This is the table of contents, the craftsman you can buy. This is perfect, the simplification of life, right? That is, you know, totally what he was about and, and totally what the ideals he was expressing. Uh, two inexpensive but charming cottages for women who want their own house. Yes. Hey. <laughs> My kind of guy. <laughs> right? I mean, cutting edge in 1906, right? To be writing that stuff. A lot of stuff about the garden. And then, you know, the craftsman idea, you know, the, the, and these were not written by him, which is so funny. Um, he, he cast a vision and then he brought all these people underneath him to kind of execute it and take it back, take it out. And so now there's a long article in this book about Irene Sargent and who she was and and how she helped. But she really was writing these articles that are so influential to this period, in this time. And then this is the 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 dreamer part in him. So. When he moved to New York, I can't remember whether he bought or leased this building, but this basically is the Craftsman building, okay? There was a restaurant, a club room. It was basically like a department store in 1908, you know, 1909. Um, Craftsman furniture displays, right? He had all this stuff going on. Look at this. He's got an ad for it. This is Building Age magazine. You can't see that. It says February 1915. That's the year he commits, you know, declares bankruptcy. And so, uh, and this is where, you know, what were you doing? You know, like, why would you, you know, throw all your money into this thing? Because the other irony is that his 1916 catalog had Colonial Revival furniture in it. So he had, he already, as a business guy, he saw the writing on the wall that the arts and crafts furniture was over and he was going to do Colonial Revival stuff, right? Because he had to sell things. And that as a pure, you know, speaker and, you know, influencer of this era, you know, he was trying to do this. <laughs> anyway, it's confusing, right? It's, it's like, what were you doing, dude? Um, I don't know whether he could have made it last longer. Uh, as we talk about uh, the gamble, uh, Green Brothers out in California, they don't last much longer than this period, too. There is totally a change in taste. But anyway, he's a fascinating figure to me. Um, Gustav Stickley and, and what he was thinking and what he built um, and how he did it. These are craftsman style homes we're very familiar with. Uh, I've always called them kind of craftsman bungalow prairies kind of thing and kind of grouped them all together. There's a lot of similarities. Um, this is from Virginia McAllister's book. This is, uh, you know, from a, from a home builder's catalog. Uh, but these details, I mean, these porches are just so... Um, typical. I just did a video on tapered columns and how they do that. Uh, the brackets, the eaves, uh, the ideas that they're expressing, right? These were simple houses uh, and beautiful houses. Examples of them built from early. And the other interesting thing is that a lot of these catalogs are 20s and 30s, right? They start to stop being built in the 30s uh, or late 20s. Um, not many are built in the 30s, but the style of the house really carried on for quite a bit of the time, certainly longer than the furniture did. These are some examples in Fort Worth, um, how they might be expressed. Uh, the simple everyman house, this is in Arlington Heights, that's in Fairmount, right? So uh, they're around, and these are the ideals that, uh, that are expressed and are, and, and are so simple and charming and, and lovely. Any questions about Stickley? Uh, Charles and Henry Green, um, they're uh, amazing architects. Uh, most of their work's in California and Pasadena, um, where they built the ultimate bungalow. Anybody been to the Gamble House in, in California? I just did a video on it. It is a mecca. You've got to go. Uh, it's a religious experience. Um, they attended trade school, so they actually were trained as craftsmen how to build things. And then they, they went out to, uh, to California because their parents had moved out there for health reasons. Um, they stop in Chicago and see the Hoden uh, exhibition, greatly influenced by it, and you'll we'll see it in their houses. Uh, this is the Gamble House. This is the house in California. Um, what was the movie that was the, uh, 
Back to the Future? If you've seen that movie, Doc Watson's garage thing is the garage for the, for the Gamble House. And so you'll see that and you, it's very famous. Um, beautiful house. Uh, this is called the Ultimate Bungalow. They did a number of bungalow houses or craftsman style houses out in California. Um, there's a number of, of unique details that they do. Now, some, one of them is that the houses are meant to grow up out of the ground. You'll see that at the lower level of these houses, they have rocks, and then the rocks turn into clinker bricks, and then these things come out. Um, you're gonna see this cloud lift pattern, which is that Japanese uh, uh, cloud lift detail. You'll see it here. The timbering that they do here is very reminiscent of the Ho Den. Uh, a lot of sleeping porches. Um, this is a kick-ass house. <laughs> This is the interior of it, right? Mmm, mm, that's right. Um, notice too how they've got this beam going around here, and then these beams going up and tie into it, very similar to the Ho Ho Den. Um, but the woodwork in here is just freaking awesome. As a woodworker, I can say that. The uh, this house at one point was going to get bulldozed, and then at another point they were going to go in, but they wanted to paint the, all the woodwork white. <laughs> They didn't, they didn't, but uh, that was the uh, story on this until they kind of figured out what they, what they had. Um, now they're greatly appreciated and everything else, but the, it's, it's amazing woodwork and workmanship, uh, very reminiscent of that Japanese craftsmanship that would have been in that ho oh, den. Um, but yeah, no, they're just fantastic houses. There's the front door, right? I told you to, to remember, that, remember that image, right? This, in my opinion, is that, right? And so you, it, the beams that go up and the things that tie together, I think they got a lot of their inspiration from uh, that ho and that they incorporated into this, into this house. If you go there, pass it in, there's walking tours that you can go on and walk around and see other, this is the Duncan Irwin house. So the Gamble house in like 1909, think it's their kind of their last big house uh, and the Gambles are the Procter and Gambles so they, the Gambles had a lot of money and so they were able to do kind of awesome stuff this is the Irwin house is a little bit earlier notice that the same ideals and same details are going on there um, these are the plans you can find them on the uh, uh, historic American building surveys look at that little little lift detail like when, where did they come up with that right <laughs> Um, but again, here you see the stones coming up out of the thing, the clinker bricks, right? Uh, these houses are meant to be very grounded. They're meant to kind of grow up out of the land, um, meant to be very organic, very simple, um, very honest, right? You see all those ideals there. Those vines took a while to grow. Yes, they did. That house is 110 years old. So, yeah. um, any questions about green and green? Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. So Frank Lloyd Wright is, is kind of the head of the Prairie School, okay? Uh, in Chicago, uh, the Prairie School, obviously Prairie School architecture. He trained under Louis Sullivan, who we studied a couple sessions ago. <laughs> I call him a creative monster. Um, he's famous for his arrogance, okay? He's famous for, um, you know, telling clients what they needed to wear uh, the night of, uh, of the opening of a house, right? Uh, he wants, I'll talk about it, you know, he wanted to design the silverware, right? He wanted to design the furniture because I don't want cheap knickknacks in my house, right? Um, and so, one, it expresses that ideal that there were a lot of cheap knickknacks, but two, that, you know, he was a creative monster. The, the, the thing that makes Frank Lloyd Wright great, in my opinion, and I don't love all of his style stuff, but the fact that his career spanned so long and he did so many different things, the Prairie School, the Estonian stuff, the Guggenheim Museum, Falling Water, reinvents himself a number of times, redoes these things, beautiful designs. He was a creative monster. Um, he's really overseeing the Prairie School. And I didn't dig into the other Prairie School architects, but there's about 10 of them. And so there's a lot of guys that, uh, that express themselves in this style. Now, if you've been to uh, Oak Park, his studio, um, and you see this kind of Louis Sullivan-esque kind of design stuff, he was obviously doing a lot of that design for Louis Sullivan, and it, it begins to express itself on, his, on the houses and stuff. 
in particular to the to the prairie style, these long, horizontally focused houses, uh, horizontal brick details. He was famous for you know uh, uh, having bricks with the mortar joints you know raked horizontally but not vertically, so it looked like these horizontal long lines. But it's certainly inspired by prairie, right? It was inspired by the landscape of Chicago, the prairie style. Uh, that's why the roofs are low slung. That's why this kind of horizontal long shape. But it's a mix of this decoration and detailing that you see there. The Roby House. Um, 1909, right? Same period as the Gamble House, but there's the brick detail, right? With the with the the none of these are Roman bricks; so they're very long, thin bricks. Uh, the uh, but certainly uh, horizontally focused, horizontally uh, inclined. Anybody find the front door? <laughs> right there, right. So this is if you look at this picture, it's around this side, okay. That's the back where the garage is. It's around this side and even walking up to it, whoop, wrong way. You know, they have to put a sign there, right? Because no one knew where the, where the front door is. It's very low. One of Frank Lloyd Wright's things was you'd walk into an entry, it'd be like right at seven feet, and then you'd walk into a space and it'd lift up like this. And so he does that everywhere. But it's funny to me that he's kind of one of the first guys who hides the front door uh, in that manner. He was, everything he did was kind of, he, he, there's no doubt he was a genius. He's one of the first guys to do this kind of open floor plan where these rooms kind of relate to one another and, and instead of being compartmentalized. This is the fireplace. This is the front side of that fireplace. But he, you know, designed the chimney so that it wouldn't block the flow um, and the way these, these, these rooms move together. Uh, this would have been a very cold room in Chicago. It's completely surrounded by leaded glass. Um, so probably wasn't very efficient. And people did complain about his houses being leaky and everything else. This is the Meyer May house, uh, again, 1909. But, I mean, capturing all of those, the decoration and the detail, uh, the leaded glass, the long eaves, the horizontal lines, right? They're, they're beautiful. Um, and then these are a couple of the interiors. Stunning, right? Yeah, cool stuff. Right here? Mm -hmm. Looks like it, doesn't it? I've never been in that house. Um, and then this is one just down the street. Uh, this is a wonderful house. His, if you're standing in front of it, his studio is like five houses up on the right. But the, this, this little wall like extends out to here. And so you've got these, these horizontal spaces. He liked protecting the front door. And so you actually have to walk around to get into it, create a lot of courtyards from the inside so that you had a more private space. Um, but yeah, they're beautiful houses. Okay, so those are the influencers, right? Those are the guys that, that are driving this style. And I, and I talk about them as influencers because um, we then have the other end, right? Those, those are the high end, right? Those are the guys that are, that are doing million dollar jobs. And what does the every man do, right? He gets a kit house. And so at the same period of time that, you're, that this is happening and actually lasting much longer are kit houses. Um, anybody read any of these books, Houses by Mail or any of these things? They're really fascinating books about the story. This one's about uh, Sears. Yeah, uh, Sears and their kind of deal. Um, but a number of companies were involved in kid houses, and we're going to talk about kind of how and why it worked, um, and maybe why it doesn't work today. These were the companies that did kid house building, right? Uh, Aladdin until 83, right? They lasted quite a long time. That's the latest one, yeah. Lewis was 75. Um, Sears and Roebuck, the most famous, um, they did between 60 and 70,000 houses. 40,000 of those were done between 28 and 31. Okay, so they, they figured out how to get better at it. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that. These were, the way they were marketed is they were made for someone who wanted to save money. Okay, and, and it doesn't look like when you look at the catalogs and you look at the, how pretty those houses and those renderings are, that that's what was taking place. But there was a lot of people who couldn't qualify for a house. 
Now, th this is 19, you know, 20. The, the FHA doesn't have a, 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 a federally funded mortgage, that a 15 or 30 year mortgage until 1935, right? Because of the Great Depression, they're trying to make houses more affordable because everyone was losing their houses. And so at this time to get a house, you had to, you know, to, well, you will see prices from, you know, 1,000 to 5,000. But you had to you had to pay that loan back within three to five years, so you know imagine paying your mortgage off in three to five years. That would have been hard, um, and so the the they didn't really have financing. So kit houses were an inexpensive way to build. Um, there a lot of times they 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 go out to farms uh, where they didn't have the labor. Uh, a lot of times they go to. Uh, uh, <laughs> what are they called? <laughs> Uh, factory housing, right? They, that like Long Bell, when they built their their city in in Washington, you know, they would contract with a company like Sears or Aladdin, and you know, build you know three streets of houses uh, from kid houses. Um, it's amazing. We'll we'll see it. I guess in a second. Um, There's, there, there was a problem with qualifying loans. There, there was, if you couldn't qualify with a loan for your bank, you were, uh, so these were troubled loan people, right? You couldn't get a conventional loan. You must oftentimes got a kid house because especially when Sears figured out how to do the financing, um, they got a lot more business. Did, did the kid house literally have everything you need to build that house? Uh, everything but the cement. But like nails, hardware, and hold that thought. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to show you. Um, you know, it seems like a no-brainer that Montgomery Wards and Sears would, would sell kit houses, right? They, if you've ever seen their catalogs from the 1880s, 1890s, you know, they were this thick, this thick and they carried everything in the house, right? And so you could order anything you wanted for your house from the Sears catalog. Um, so building uh, kit houses seemed natural because they wanted to sell building materials. They wanted to sell this kind of stuff. And these are the Montgomery Wards and Sears version of the building catalog, but they failed for a long time. And Sears could not make their kit house thing work. And so in like 1912 or something, they put this guy in charge of it. I can't remember his name. And he's the one who figured out how to, how to make it work and how to make it profitable. And then when they figured out the financing, it just went gangbusters. Um, yeah, their biggest year was 29 to 31 when they figured out uh, the financing. It came in two freight cars typically, okay? And it did carry everything for the house except concrete and plaster. Um, they say that it stopped, they stopped doing it as houses became more technologically advanced, although we know the Latin did it for much longer. Most of them peter out in the 30s and 40s because of World War II and the Great Depression. Um, Sears actually stops doing it in like 33 then picks it up again in like 35 and then it stopped by 40. So the Great Depression really had a you know, tough time on this market. This is the most expensive house. The Magnolia, 5849. I mean, look at all the things that downspouts, sash weights, hardware, eave trough, uh, casing that was for plumbing. Colonnade roofing, painting materials, mantles, tile, grout, right? It's crazy. And the buyer had to know how to do all this himself. Yeah, and so, the, <laughs> what's, your, what's your point? Um, <laughs> this is, uh, this is probably from like 19, uh, they would, this is 1918, the manual for construction, okay? So this, you know, shows you the radiators, the tile, how, how these things go together. It was, it was kind of an odd Dell's book, right? Which is how to build a house and talking about siding and trim. Uh, a lot of these kit houses, uh, everything came numbered. So they knew that there was, you know, people that couldn't afford uh, or could, didn't, couldn't afford a builder. So literally the studs were, were numbered, like you could put it together that way. So. Uh, a lot of them went a long way towards, you know, improving the, the building process by making it a, you know, paint by number kind of building process, which is kind of crazy. But they would have sent a book like this, right, um, along with the, you know, how to do it. And, you know, people would put it together. Now, if you read this book, 
It was a very popular book, you know, 20 years ago. They've actually gone back and chased these houses down and you can see them where they are and stuff. And if you go on the internet, there's, there's tons of houses there. But, and so there is, there's no doubt the houses were built. There's no doubt the houses were charming. Um, it's kind of a fascinating story. This is the mid-range house, the Martha Washington. The pier and beam, yeah. And so it, it, it appears that a lot of people um, would do the excavation themselves, uh, not always having a basement, and then would kind of build up from there. Uh, and then this was their cheapest house. Um, <laughs> the, these were these were houses that would sometimes be lake houses. These would be uh, summer cottages. These were, there, there are pictures of, these, of people putting the, these houses together in like two days. There's one of the advertisements was a time-lapse photo of these houses being constructed and put together. So, um, you know, they would be used for a lot of different things, and, uh, but, it, but it's a fascinating period of time. And then here's some covers from Aladdin. Now, the reason why I'm showing you all this is because... I'm asking the question as we get to the end of this period, why are these houses so charming? Why are they better designed than new houses today, right? What, what happened? Um, because the, uh, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright, obviously they're doing their high end stuff, but those are cheap houses and yet they're really charming, right? Those are well-designed, good looking houses that, you know, and so what happened? I've got a number of theories. <laughs> um, and, and, and this, you know, just showing you all the different design influences, the different people. Remember, the magazines are speaking into the homeowners of what they should build. You've got the top designers like uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, you know, everybody's, everybody has a voice. Why was everybody doing things the same? Why were they all building, producing beautiful houses? I think um, great design requires a design philosophy. And that's why my chair is here, and that's why that chair is here. Um, because a design philosophy is a, uh, a, a narrative. It's a story about why something matters or why something's there. And those things, that narrative and that design philosophy are not taking place in a lot of new houses today. If you look at the, this is the Barcelona chair. Mies van der Rohe, this is the Barcelona exhibit. Um, these, th he designed these chairs to, to fit into to that space. Very modern, this is 1950-something, um, and incredibly influential chair. When you break it down and when you look at it, look what's going on with this chair, okay? That this back, these are all circles, right? And so they're, they're, they're creating radiuses that, that are happening. Here's one big one, center line uh, the, right in the middle. There's one coming off the back, right? It's center line. It's creating this square that captures the whole thing. I mean, what a beautifully designed. No wonder we're attracted to it. No wonder we look at it and go, oh, that's really pretty. I don't know why I like it, right? I've, I've done videos on regulating lines of houses while you look at a house and go, I know I like it, but I don't know why. It's because there's regulating lines tying the house together, making it, helping it make sense in our brain and helping, it, helping us to understand it, even though you can't see the design ideals that are taking place. The reason Frank Lloyd Wright wanted to design all these chairs is because his houses had a narrative and a story and a design philosophy that he wanted those things to fit. I don't want you messing up my houses, putting things in it that don't fit the philosophy that I've created, right? And so you see all these different chairs, there's the Roby House chair, that, um, that are fitting into this philosophy that was very important to him. And then the round chair. This is a very famous from the, um, uh, this is the first chair I bought <laughs> that I like spent money. I go, I got to have one of those chairs. Now, why did I get so, you know, enamored by this chair? Um, anybody guess? <laughs> it's beautifully constructed, okay? Notice, notice how the arm, which is flat, carefully moves back into this backrest and then goes back down so seamlessly, right? Look how these connections and this joinery here are, are so simple. This 
chair fits in a mid-century modern house. It was designed in the 1940s, 1950s. This fits in a low ceiling ranch style house, right, that expresses these ideals. And so when you see that it's beautifully constructed, it's as simple as possible, right? There, there's not the crazy ornamentation in here. It's, uh, it's comfortable to sit in, right? It functions, it's designed well, it's beautiful, it's attractive. And you start putting all these things together and you're like, oh yeah. Now, there's a design philosophy with that chair, with this chair. It's, it's a, you know, you'll spend $1,500 to $2,500 for one of these chairs. They are beautiful. And there's a design philosophy and a narrative there. It's not a coincidence, okay, that Van Gogh said this was a self-portrait and this was his friend, okay? There is, he feels like I'm simple. Um, this is a, a farm chair. This expresses who I am. I, my friend was much more flamboyant. My friend, you know, was, was uh, more of a character, right? And so, does, do, do you get, get, you know what I'm saying? There, there's a design philosophy and chairs, there's a reason why architects are trying to design their chair, right? That the chair is so important because it expresses their ideals in a very simple, look, here's my ideal, right? Here's, here's my design philosophy, here's what I believe, right here, right? And so if you can do that, you are expressing your uh, beliefs and you're, you're communicating very clearly in a very simple object. So, why do those houses look better, right? Um, I've got a lot of theories, but one is that our houses today don't just have a design philosophy. I believe the builders and homeowners and a lot of people um, build a house by assembling these parts. You go, go pick your brick, go pick your windows, go pick your hardware, go pick your, you know, and then I'll assemble them, I'll put them together. Okay, no, <laughs> um, you can't do that because you know, if you go, if you've been to the hardware store, it's like, it's like a wall like this long all the way across of every different style and every different hardware. It's not, it's, you know, if you've read the book, The Paradox of Choice, where, where people are overwhelmed by so much that they can't make a decision. And so, uh, unless there is a design philosophy that we are going to be simple and clean, okay, uh, our house is going to be very rustic. It's going to be an early period English house. Okay, well, what hardware would go in that? Well, in that period, they only had iron hardware. So we need to go to iron hardware. All of a sudden, you've nixed 80% of that wall and you're talking about iron hardware, right? Why? Because there is a, there's a design philosophy that is gonna unify the house. So it's not a mix and match of all these different things that don't work together. But if you think about how stickly, and those guys would think about, okay, there's no ornamentation in my house. I'm gonna let the natural beauty of the wood show through. I'm going to, uh, it's going to be an honest house. It's going to be a simple house, right? Those are all defining theories and design philosophy things that will unify it. So I don't have carved moldings in that house, right? I, I don't have heavily ornamented things. I have simple things. And so there's the design philosophy. I think we've also lost a common language, okay? And we'll talk more about this when we talk about Levitt and modernism and what's going on there. But... The classical language, and I've told, said this before, it used to be that the chair rail was an understood, it's always the pedestal of a column, I'm trying to look for a pedestal here, I don't have one, it's always at, at, at you know, some height, but it's not 36 inches, and it drives me crazy when people put a chair rail 36 inches in their house, because it's not right, right? <laughs> Why isn't it right? Well, because the classical language expresses that there's a pedestal and a column and an entablature, and those things help us read a room, help us think, make, realize things are beautiful. And so that classical language gets lost, and we'll talk about it more in the modern period, why it gets lost, but we no longer, if you ask, and I, got, I nearly got in fights over the internet about saying that the chair rail is 36 inches. It's never 36 inches. You measure the back of the chair in the dining room and that's, no, that's not what you do. So um, anyway, there, there's, there's three or four pieces here that we've lost. I think the architects have abandoned residential construction, okay? that they, it, Frank Lloyd Wright, 95% of his stuff was residential, right? Who's the star architect today? You know, Frank Gehry, right? I guarantee you 95% of his houses are, or his projects are not uh, residential. 
the architecture schools aren't training in residential design, right? Because most of the money is made in commercial construction. And so it's hard to be a good residential architect who understands classical detailing because those things aren't taught anymore. And so we've lost the architect, we've lost the chief designer in the process. And then modern audiology, I'll talk about that. I think at that period there was what I call trickle down design. How much? Are you? Um, Trickle down design was that Frank Lloyd Wright, Gustav Stickley, you know, the Green Brothers could design something. And then uh, these guys, any builder magazine could put these things together. There was, there was home building catalogs from face brick companies. There was, you know, Long Belt Lumber had a, had a home building catalog. The, there, there was all kinds of people that put out house plans in this period. And yet they're, they're good looking. Why is that? Because everybody looked at the great design, and then the builders copied really well, okay? Builders now, because of Levitt, we'll talk about them more, you know, control design, and they push the architect out of the way. And so there's not a designer in the process. What do builders care about? Making money, right? I don't blame them. I'd like to make more, more money, right? But they, they push the designer out of the way. We have ugly houses. Think, see this? Builders think that because the house is selling, it's well designed. Yikes! Homeowners think that because it was built, someone must have designed it. <laughs> Both things are false. <laughs> okay? That's, that, that's, that's the problem. I wrote my book, Time with House and Instigation, because I wanted homeowners to realize the fallacy of what was going on here and to build better. So, those are my theories. Second question. Why are we so enchanted by the arts and crafts era? This is the Brent Hall theory. But if you compare 1900 and 2000, the similarities are abound. Victorian style, okay, and the McMansions are very similar, okay? Victorian houses were done during a period of, of a lot of growth in the middle class. The Industrial Revolution was making people uh, be able to afford a lot more things and want to buy more things. The Industrial Revolution made the, the making of uh, brackets and millwork and all those things very cheap and very accessible. McMansions, uh, the internet revolution, right? You have a lot of new wealth coming up because of the internet. You have a lot of fake products being uh, coming onto the market uh, with, new, with new technology. And we'll talk about those. The change in the role of women, we'll talk about that in the, in the, uh, in the magazines and how they're doing. But the desire for better craft and well-made things, I think, is happening today, right? The Yeti cooler is an example of that. Because they looked at the igloo and they go, they saw the bear go to the commercial, just tear the tear the igloo cooler part, and these are meant to last for a bear attack, right? Like we have bear attacks attacking our <laughs> Yeti cooler. But we want well-made things, right? We look at that and go, well, I want a better-made thing. I don't want to buy something cheap. Does that sound familiar, right? <laughs> I think that those are the same. So this overwrought, you know, crazy Queen Anne thing with all these different styles, I mean, this, the Turkish onion, the, the Queen Anne English stuff, I mean, all crazy stuff. And then this knucklehead, that guy has built that house like six times in the Metroplex. It's, a, it's sinful. It's sinful. There is one in Vicaro. Bungalow house, right? A rejection of that Victorian stuff, a very simple, clean house. I think the cottage home movement is a, is a return to simplicity. I think the one of the reasons, what's her name? Joanna Gaines, you know, was, was popular because she caught this simplicity. Uh, you think of uh, Sarah Suzanka's house, the, the book, The Not So Big House, right? A rejection of the overdone Victorian stuff. I mean, one of her things is, we spend money on a dining room that we never go into. You know, let's have this not so big, but smaller house built better, right? Those are ideals that, and that was a number one selling book. Those things are, those matter. And so, again, a, a similarity between the two eras. Lifestyle Revolution 1900, you have the early magazines and stuff going on. These magazines came out the same year. Real Simple Magazine and Dwell, right? Both expressing these simplified, simple ideas. What are they reacting to? The McMansions, right? They're, they're reacting to that overbuilt, 
crazy, silly, cheaply built stuff. Let's get simple. Let's look, you know, look at that house. I mean, <laughs> if that's a house. Um, completely different. And then I would argue that the more share, the, the infatuation with, you know, unfa unpainted, clean line, let the beauty of the wood come through, is that, right? But let's not cut that wood at all. You know, let's let the natural slab of the wood be our, be our beautiful thing. I mean, look at the, you know, you go on Instagram and there's 10 people building slab furniture now. Um, and so it's that, those same ideals. So that's the reason why I think that we are, you know, so enamored by this because the, we're th we think the same thing that they thought 100 years ago, right? We're like, ah, I don't like that. I don't, I don't want to express myself that way. I don't want to be over the top. I want to be simple. I want to build honest things, right? And so that's why. That's my theory. Anybody buying that? Yes, sure. <laughs> so lessons to take home. Work on this design philosophy. If you're a builder, if you're a homeowner, if you're about to build a house, if you're thinking about that, um, if you're remodeling your bungalow, okay, there is a story, there is a narrative there that the new things that you put in, if you're going to put in a kitchen, okay, it probably shouldn't be ornamented with carving on it, right? And so th there, are, there are ways to, you know, infuse that same ideal, that same design philosophy, that story into your projects so that it doesn't look like 10 years later, you come in and go, oh yeah, they did this 10 years ago, I remember that tile, right? Yeah. It's, it's the same story, it's the same ideal. And then what I always say, looking at the past, by the way, shout out to my wife, all the cookies, all the food, all the other stuff, come on, round of applause. <laughs> Practicing the past, there's so much to learn in the past, so much great stuff. I think that's my last one. Okay, and the next one's March 31st. We're going to be talking about the period revival, English uh, colonial revival, all that stuff. Should be really fun. We're going to talk about kitchens. We're also going to talk about the technology that went into those houses. Thank you. Thank you. Food, beer, help yourself. <laughs>